is maybe the most obvious thing to ask about first, but why don't we um, begin with the, the surface uh, of the film. Um, it seems especially pertinent because you, were, um, you also shot the, the film. Could you, um, could you talk a bit about the decision to work in, um, in black and white 16 millimeter, but um, uh, I think I'm, I'm specifically interested in the, uh, uh, the decision to hand process uh, that film because it gives it uh, such a you know such a unique texture especially within this kind of context um, yeah the decision to to shoot in this way was a decision that was taken a long time ago really because I've been working uh, shooting film and hand processing it for for a long time before this film this is the, the first feature film that I've done it on but for me um, and for the producers of the film as well. It was kind of a no-brainer by this stage. This is how we would do it. Um, <clears throat> with regard to the hand processing, which is, which I think is the thing that people do comment about, um, I just, I just love processing film, and uh, I'd always done it on short films and the old roll of film, and I thought, well, why don't, you know, what, what, why not do three miles instead of fifty feet? <laughs> And I imagine... It I wasn't fun by the end, though. No. <laughs> and I would imagine um, in the editing of the film, um, the, uh, you know, the textures that result from the hand processing, uh, I'm sure, enter into your calculations about um, how, to, how to arrange the images. Um, could, you, could you talk a bit about the, the derivation of this, um, the film's rhythmic structure? It's, it's, it's very unique, and I imagine um, for a lot of viewers, it probably... Uh, it probably reminds them more of certain like canonical works of uh, experimental cinema than the uh, than maybe the like kitchen sink realist films that the plot uh, might evoke. Yeah, and I, I think um, the 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 realism issue or question has been asked before as well, uh, um, which is something I you know I'm, it's obviously not realism, and I don't I'm not particularly interested in in realism. Um, I, I find it quite a problematic um, idea, really, because uh, you know it's obviously linked to reality, which is entirely subjective. So, so for me, this film is my reality. It's got how I how I see the world in scratched 16 millimeter black and white film, but um, it's not a kitchen sink dra uh, kitchen sink kind of um, reality. Um, sorry, I've lost your question. Oh yeah, so, yeah, so, and so the, yeah, the rhythm of it and the, the editing is that what you? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah it's, it's a strange mixture the way that I work in that we, because we're shooting on film, we're spending money all the time on a, on a real material, so we don't tend to have the camera rolling forever. So there's very tight shot lists for scenes. Everything's very carefully planned, but because it's on hundred foot spools. Um, if I get to sort of 95 feet on a roll and I need 10 feet to film the next shot, I need to change that roll of film. But instead of wasting the five feet that I did have at the end, I'll quickly grab a shot of something that's going on at that moment. It might be an inanimate object within the scene or it might be a cutaway of, um, or a close-up or a character detail or something like that, which means when I get into the edit, I have a very, uh, a very quick edit assembled based on the based on the script we we only ever shoot one take and one safety so there's not a lot of time deciding which which shot to use that's all done very quickly so we have a, a very quick script assemble and then this bin of just crazy footage that was never in the script and was just grabbed on location which then gets worked into the collage that you see yeah. is much is much of it um, edited in camera, because I think, because uh, you do that in some of your other work. Um, no, not not so much. I mean, y y I don't I don't shoot any coverage, so it's not like I shoot um, a wide shot and then go in for mids and close ups and all that kind of thing. I, I I shoot exactly how I imagine it when I'm writing it, and then when that doesn't work in the script, which often it doesn't, that's when I bring in these other these other. Um, close-ups to create that kind of um, that kind of montage. So, 
sometimes I'll have sequences that I'll look at the rushes, I'll look at the, a roll of film, and things will will kind of be in sequence. But uh, but I don't I, yeah I don't edit within the camera yeah. on this kind of thing. And um, I was also I was curious about um, you know how you how you because uh, one of the most striking things about the the editing of the film is the use of uh, flash forwards, flashbacks. Uh, often a single frame or a couple frames uh, in a way that, um, uh, for me at least, like kind of evokes some of these, uh, like, like a, some Gregory Markopoulos films, which, which were edited in camera largely. Um, uh, could you talk a bit about how you think through sort of uh, when to deploy those, uh, how they fit into, the, into your writing process even? Yeah, they're not really particularly in the edit, uh, in, the, in the script. They're, they're, they're things that will come out within the editing. So I will, um, I'll put a scene together um, according to how it's been written, first off, like I was saying. And then quite often I'll have a shot that maybe isn't part of that scene. It doesn't work within that scene. So um, I, I don't um, get rid of it, though. I keep it and think that, that can go somewhere else. And I think part of that's just because we're shooting on film and I've hand-processed it as part of this three miles of footage, I'm quite attached to those shots. And I don't like the idea of the cutting room floor. I don't like any of my footage being in, on the cutting room floor. And quite often I've used, if we've shot two takes of something, I end up using both takes. Because I think, oh, actually I like both those takes. Is there somewhere that we could work that in somewhere else? So um, an example would be where, where Wenner, the young girl, gets arrested after... Um, headbutting the, the guy outside the house. I had a shot of a close-up of handcuffs being put on her that was going to start the scene of her being arrested. Which, is, you know, in, in the edit, I thought, it's not very subtle. You know? <laughs> and actually, the flow was ruined, and, and the shot that you actually first see of her getting arrested is this kind of out-of-focus shot that comes into focus of the police kind of leading her to the car and holding her mother back. And that was much more powerful, so there was no room for the close-up of the... Um, of the handcuffs being put on. But I kept it because I thought that could work somewhere else. It could either be a flashback or a flash forward. And if it was a flashback, it works in a particular way. So later on in the film, ha her having been arrested, you could flash back to that moment and show that detail of her being arrested, but it becomes like a reminder for the audience to say, oh, remember when she was getting arrested? Didn't that have a big meaning? You know, and it's kind of a bit... It's a bit spoon feeding, but then I thought, what about if I flash forward to that moment, but not actually that far before it, and put it into the scene before she commits the crime that she gets arrested for? And then, when you watch it back, I think, ah, shit, this has got a different meaning now. This is before she's committed this thing that she thinks is going to have a real big impact. She's going to show them by throwing this ball at their car, which just bounces off it anyway. But if you show her having her handcuffs put on before she does that, it, kind of, it has a different meaning. And for me, it means you know, that her fate is sort of sealed at that point. She's, she's, help, she's, um, she's powerless as a person because of who she is within that community. But that was never meant to be there. That wasn't in the script. And it wasn't in it. In, in the moment I shot that shot, I wasn't thinking of that. But in the edit, these things become apparent. And just by trying things, you, I then think, well, there's, you know, there's a meaning that can be reverse engineered. And you know, maybe it was always there. It was just it comes out when the edit is taking shape. I'll ask uh, one more uh, rather practical question, then we'll, uh, we'll uh, see if there are any questions in the audience. Um, I, I think there's, there, um, there's no direct sound in the film. It's all ADR. Um, um, could you t I, was, I was curious how that. Um, how that uh, complicated or enhanced uh, your work with the actors um, in the film? Um, I think, uh, in terms of the actors, I think it's, it enhances what, the way that they can work. And I think right across the board, it's a, it's a real positive not, work, not using um, location sound. There was, we went to the Museum of um, Moving Image today, and um, there was a bit... The, the sort of history of the camera, and it ends with, um, or there's a section in the museum there where it shows the first sound recording, so the, the jazz singer. You know, for me, that's that kind of, I said to somebody who was there, that, you know, that's the beginning of the end, that point, you know, where suddenly 
everybody's obsessing about sound. And it's the same with the way that we work, that you know, we haven't got a lot of resources and we haven't got a lot of time and we haven't got a lot of film stock. So let's worry about the audio later on. That was the first thought that I had when I, when I thought of just... And, and also shooting on a Bolex, which sometimes it's running at 24 frames a second. <laughs> sometimes it's about 19. Sometimes it's at 30, depending on how it feels that day or you know, how warm it is or humid it is or whatever. So sync sounds very difficult. Um, and also what I'd found in the past when I had recorded sync sound, that quite often the first stage of post-production sound was repairing things. And I think that's a really bad point to start at when you go into the sound design thing, right, what have we got to fix? Whereas if you've got nothing, you start with, you know, what can we do? You don't, you don't create problems. You sort of, you know, you can just build and be creative with it. With the actors, it's, yeah, it's really interesting because I did think um, you, that you can hone performances with doing the ADR. And I thought, because I've got no... I'm replacing everything. I can kind of create performances with the actors in the studio, but you really can't. Even though there's no dialogue recorded on location, the performance, and because quite a lot of it, as you'll see, is big close-ups, that performance is set physically, and the words are really quite unimportant, in a sense. Once they... And it, they're all the same actors, obviously, who, you know, they're, they're not voiced by other people, so those people come... Those actors come back in, and they, and they do say the lines in exactly the same way, because they're thinking the same motivations, but more importantly, they've got the same shape mouths as, <laughs> as when they said it on location. And so it's, it, it's all very um, uniform, in the, and they do, they do kind of speak the words in the same way that it did on location. Um, but the performance, like I say, is already there. You, can, you know, I tried tweaking little bits of it and softening bits or hardening lines, and it does work to a certain extent, but once you get to a certain point, it becomes quite surreal because the eyes aren't doing what the voice is doing. So, yeah, I mean, the, the, the sort of first-time actors that are in the film, for them it was, it was fine, because they didn't know any different, really. I just said, we're doing it like this, and they said, yep, okay. The more experienced actors, some of them were more nervous about doing it. And then the very experienced um, TV actors that were in, were in the film were just saying, well, this is, this is how we do everything now anyway. So one of the actors who had a, just a single scene in the film um, has got quite a big part on... Uh, series called Poldark in, in the UK. And he said, yeah, we, you know, pretty much all the dialogues ADR'd. So it was, you know, they're, they're very used to it in the same way that people would have been used to it a few decades ago. Yeah, and I, I, I read um, in an interview uh, that, y that you did, um, I, was, I was reading this earlier today, you, you, you brought up uh, Brasson in relation to, um, to the dubbing and working with the actors and this kind of disjunction of uh, body and voice, um, which is really striking here, I think. Yeah, and I think, you know, part of that, um, the sort of formality of the way the actors perform physically, a lot of that's to do with how we shoot and, um, and not being able to move the camera and focus pull <laughs> at the same time. So I normally choose one or the other. So it, it, it introduces a formality to the, the physicality of the actors, which then... I think naturally comes through the the performance of the dialogue, which I, you know, I'd, again, it's going back to realism, I suppose, is getting away from that idea of kind of de delivering something in a realistic manner, what, what, you know, whatever that might be. <laughs> um, why don't we take some questions from the audience? Uh, we'll bring you a microphone. Yeah, right here. You mentioned Brisson. I'm interested in who uh, were your other visual references, who you had in mind, and I'll just add, at various points in my mind when I was watching the film, I thought of like old anthropological films like Robert Flaherty, I thought of uh, Joan of Arc and you know the three, four frame and those extreme close-ups. Um, who did you have in mind? I didn't, I didn't really have anybody in mind at the time but I think those, the names that you mention are probably the ones that come up most. And I think it's, it, that's probably born out of a necessity in the way that this film was shot and in the same way that those, many of those films were shot. It's certainly the documentary, the kind of, you know, the, the documentary stuff. Um, and kind of Humphrey Jennings as well was a, a, a big influence more recently. And I think it's, 
I like to do things as simply as possible, and I think that's probably the same way that those filmmakers were working. Sometimes for artistic reasons, but quite often for logistical reasons. So how you know how can you tell how can you tell the story of this scene in in three shots, for example, rather than overcomplicating it? And I'm always thinking of you know if we can if we can cover this scene in five shots, can we cover it in four shots you know, without going to one shot and a wide shot, which is what I'm not interested in, but you know, the, the simplicity. So I think, um, I think that's why those, why those names come up. Whether I had any, anybody conscious, consciously in mind, I don't know. But, I mean, Bresson is somebody that I'm interested in um, in, in, his, in, in his theories as, uh, just as much as his work, but also his... Um, kind of pursuit of, of simplicity, I think. And I think in the, in the interview you mentioned, I think you probably mentioned that the, the Scorsese quote of if you're stuck, you know, ask yourself what Bresson would do and that would probably help you out because he, he wouldn't do much. <laughs> um. The, the film the film moved me in ways I didn't expect. I felt at times like I had been transported in a time machine, and I swore I was expecting to see Albert Finney come around the corner at some point of the village. But uh, I wanted to ask you about one thing that it particularly, one of many things that particularly impressed me about your film, which is the agency given the female characters. That's plural and multiple. Could you talk a little bit about uh, conceiving the, the spectrum of femininity in this film, which is, is quite potent, I think. Yes. <laughs> well, it's interesting, because um, Wenna, who's the, 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 the young um, female character, who, who effectively, for me, is the sort of hope for the, for the future of, of, of the community, was a, for a very long time uh, a boy. And it was actually Kate, um, the producer, who said, how about making him female? Which, of course, my first reaction was, no, nope, that will never work. But once, once I tried it, and, or once we, we flipped it around, it just worked brilliantly. Because suddenly there, were, there was this vitality coming from, you know, not from a... Not not from somebody who could sort of be written off as a as a bit of a job. There was something a bit more um, layered going on with her, and the, and then we kind of introduced a sort of backstory to her, partly through her surname, um, which obviously only comes up in the in the credits at the end, but is something that's very much within the script for all of us making the film. You know, where where her what her family makeup is and what her agency is within within the village and in a way she's kind of the one constant that runs through it for me she's the one person who who doesn't change she says it as it is from the start and actually kind of everybody comes around to to her by the end um so other than that i don't really i don't really know how to how to answer your your question other than you know, I, I just tried to write people as I saw them, and I didn't. And I wanted, I didn't want there to be anybody who was out and out, kind of bad or out and out good within the film, which I know is a very simplistic thing to say, but that did force force us to look at, you know, the, the, one of the other prominent female characters, which is um, Sandra, the the second homeowner, who uh, who hopefully is more. Um, Sophisticated and multi-led, and than she than she could have been as well. Sorry, it's a bit of a cop-out answer. <laughs> so we have time for a couple more questions here. Oh, hold on one second. Shit, he's going to bring your microphone. Colonel uh, Biswicken. <laughs> Miraz, Colonel Biswicken. Um, it's very touching for me because I'm. Cameron Redruth girl. Oh, great. <laughs> right. Proper Cornish. Yes, proper Cornish. Mm. And uh, you, you capture.
captured some very, uh, those very precious aspects of the Cornish personality and uh, what's happening there today. Um, that has been going on now gradually since the war ended and the influx of uh, other, other nationalities into Cornwall. So it's very touching, and I feel very teary about the whole movie. And thank you, and I um, think it's wonderful that you're here. Thank you. Um, maybe then, uh, I, maybe we can conclude then on a, on a question I, I meant to ask earlier uh, about um, how the, uh, the gentrification thematic kind of um, took shape through uh, your writing process, be, uh, you know, like, could you could you walk us through how you sort of arrive at this kind of this par It's like a parable of sorts about about it, um, but in the form of this like fraternal antagonism. Yeah. Um, yeah, there wasn't really any development. It was just always there, because <laughs> it is always there, you know, and that that is that really is the story of um, of where I come from. Where th we are um, a very in a very industrial region or nation that has become this kind of playground and this uh, leisure destination, and it's particularly prominent at the moment because it looks like um, we're going to have a huge political change, possibly sometime. Well, it's supposed to be today, but presumably sometime in the next sort of twenty years it will happen. Um, where, <laughs> whereby. Um, it, it, it is kind of like a fisherman said to me, you know, he said, once I'm gone, not me, him, he said, once I'm gone, this is just going to be a playground for rich people. And it's kind of, you know, that, and that's, it's not simple. It's really not a simple issue. And I've got, you know, friends of mine who, they make all of their money out of people with a lot of money coming in and buying houses that they don't live in because they're, you know, a mate of mine is a plumber and all of his work is, working on these houses and everybody's reliant on it. So I'm not saying it's a, it's a simple issue, but it's something that's there. And it's really, there's a lot of resentment just below the surface. And sometimes a bit comes out, you know, which is what I'm trying to show in this film. But, but it, it's, there's a real simmering sense of um, alienation that if it isn't addressed and if it isn't recognized, it manifests itself in pretty grim ways, which I think, you know, we're seeing all over the world at the moment. In this very city, in fact. Um, <laughs> yeah, but uh, that's all we have time for, but uh, thank you for the film, and thank you for being here. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for coming.